have. All right, we're going to try this one more time. I think I got rid of whatever that was going on. Yeah. So, <laughs> we're back, Ghost Education 101, a little technical difficulty, but hey, you know, it's electronics. What can you expect? Um, so we have Ron Yacovetti, a wonderful ITC person. I'm gonna jump right into this and let him get going. And I think I um, got your screen share open back up, so. I'll let you just go for it. All right, cool. Thank you for everybody who joined and then rejoined. Uh, <laughs> it's ghost education. It's not broadcast education. Clearly, we uh, had a little hiccup with that. So that yeah, was odd. <laughs> Somebody was talking and it wasn't us. Usually, we, we welcome that kind of a thing. <clears throat> so what I, I was just going to briefly say is that so I started about a decade ago as a ghost hunter, paranormal investigator, uh, whatever you call it. I didn't even use the word researcher at the time. And um, I found a, a path or I had an, an affinity developed for ITC because one investigation I did early on, um, just before I became part of a team out in Los Angeles where I lived for 14 years, that's where I, I began. And um, it was Debbie Constantino, the late Debbie Constantino was an amazing EVP uh, practitioner and a friend of mine, Scott, and then Chad Lindbergh from Fast and the Furious, amongst a, a bunch of other shows, he did a show with John Altenny. And they had 30 people sitting in the hallway in the floor, third floor of the Glen Tavern Inn in Santa Paula, California. And everybody introduced themselves for this ITC session. And then it got to the last three people. And my friend Scott said his name. And then Debbie said her name. And then a little pause. And then Chad Lindbergh goes, and I'm Chad. Nice to meet you. And within seconds, 10, 15 seconds, a very clear voice eclipsed the static and it said, I know Chad. And I was like, what is that? And where do I get one? Because I just found a hobby and a direction. And I got hooked. And I thought that that, that to me is as amazing. And I'll talk a little bit about EVP tonight. As amazing as EVP and any paranormal effect captured is, um, the possibility of being able to talk to a dimension or realm or spirit or energy or whatever we're communicating with in any fashion that's close to or, or resembling real time like you and I are doing now um, was staggering to me that that was even possible. So I got hooked. And so I started going into ITC and I, and I have ghost boxes and I had the spirit boxes that everybody had. And then I eventually uh, I developed a more definitive path and, and area of, of research and focus, the longer I did it because I found things that people who were here before me did that just blew me away. And so for me, it goes beyond what is considered, I guess, ghost hunting or paranormal research. It's really so much more that after a decade, I realized I don't know. Um, I will, to quote uh, Mike Ricksecker, um, who's a phenomenal researcher, um, he's got a new book out called A Walk in the Shadows. He says in his book that, you know, he reserves the right to be wrong or change his mind. Um, I, I feel the same way. I know a lot more than I think I did six months ago, six years ago. Um, I should be smarter tomorrow and a year after that. So um, some of what I say now, I, I may not agree with me. Um, flash forward. And, and maybe some things I will, I will hold true with. It, it's really based on uh, what I learned, what my experiences are. And then how those things kind of direct me and where I go. So I'll go through, I guess, the, the presentation I have and just talk about it. Um, one thing, I guess, for me that I feel is a little bit different about me as an ITC researcher. Um, I know there are some incredible people in the field who are who are builders, who make boxes. You have the Steve and Katie Holte, Katie Stafford, Jay Prather, um, Austin Maynard, uh, Tony Rathman. Um, Rob Hernandez, there's so many people who are just brilliant and they build phenomenal stuff. Um, I'm not a builder. Um, I do have technical knowledge that I try to acquire. Um, I try to understand how the devices work, the functionality and, and why they do what we think they do. Um, but I also am very heavy in, in what I do or believe on the philosophy of it. To me, um, so many brilliant people like them and other people in the field are, and yourself, Philip, 
who are gathering great evidence and doing phenomenal research. But because we know we can get that kind of information and we can gather it, to me, one of the more important things is, is how does that plug into the paradigm as it's accepted now? How does that plug into your belief systems, to your biases and, and how you present it and how you share it? And then how you juxtapose that from what you used to know or from what somebody else's work shows. And so to me, that's why the philosophy of it and understanding its relationship with history, with science, with the forefathers of it is, is almost a heavier presence in, in what my ITC preach or preaching is um, because of those things really helped shape the way that I look at it. So I will share this and then I'll just go through what it is I have here and hopefully everybody likes it. So uh, the invisible art, that's a term that, um, that I came to know from uh, a woman you, you also know, um, Dr. Annabella Cordoso, who's a tremendous ITC researcher. She's in Spain now. Um, originally, um, such a, just a kick-ass lady. She um, first female diplomat to the country of Portugal. And she worked with some of the people, and I'll mention them as we get into this, um, who were some of the, the legends and really pillars of, of the ITC background and history on the European side. She got to work with those people. And her work itself is really phenomenal. She has three books. She just released her third book. Um, I recommend go on Amazon and look for her books. And so she changed my life. She got me into what we'll talk about, which is direct radio voice research. Um, which is a, a, an arm of ITC that actually predates the ghost boxes that everybody knows. And um, so that is a term she used in one of her books calling it the invisible art. I just thought that was brilliant because it is an art form like a lot of other things that, that people do in different walks of life. And um, it's methodologies, as it says here, for real-time spirit communication, which is for us, a lot of us, is, is the goal. We want to be able to do with whatever realm or area we're communicating what you and I are doing right now, which is have a dialogue, learn from each other. What is it like there? What is it like here? And so that's part of what kind of got me going. These are just some things. Again, these are my thoughts. You're going to see these are things that are my thoughts and opinions, things that I've kind of put into practice. Um, part of, again, my philosophy of, of this stuff. You don't have to agree with all of it. You can love it all or hate it all. Um, I'm just sharing my experience. It is um, not expertise. This is not um, necessarily, I mean, some things might be fact, right? Like I am who I am. <laughs> but for the most part, it's, I'm, I'm not preaching facts and I'm not telling you I have all the answers and figured it out. And, and I probably will use the term we don't know quite a bit because I think that's accurate. So a lot of this stuff is anecdotal. A lot of this stuff is theoretical. Um, so, and then to start here, goal of ITC. This may vary for a lot of people. I mean, at its roots, just like a lot of paranormal investigating started um, in the last 50 years, give or take with, you know, with, with the Warrens, let's say, and, and uh, Hans Holzer, um, it was helping people who were going through a bereavement period, right? They lost a loved one. That could be a pet sometimes for some people. Um, that is a big part of, of doing this. A lot of people will seek out ITC or, or paranormal people who do communication, whether it's EVP, to connect with a loved one that they really feel uh, a, a level of separation anxiety from, that they're really feeling the loss. And the same way they continue to, in first, you know, probably centuries, went to a psychic or, you know, or a medium to connect with somebody who they really missed, or some type, you know, people may be looking for answers also, but I think the, the emotional human side of it, I think, is where a lot of it started. Um, Another reason that people may do this is to gain insight into past events. Uh, some people try to get insight on future events. You know, I'm sure there was a lot of people during the pandemic that were asking about when is it going to be over? How is it going to end? What's going to happen? Um, I can't speak for everybody. I know that there's a lot of really, again, brilliant people in the field that I know and, and those I don't know um, who may have asked those questions, who may have acquired answers to that stuff. It does not mean that the answers are factual. Um, if something does play out in a, in a prophetic kind of a sense, that's awesome. And that's, that's, that's rewarding. That's one of the reasons why we do this stuff. Um, some people will have, on the next point, they'll be looking for, for answers. They have a pursuit for answers. They've had 
paranormal experience and growing up. Uh, our show that's on Monday nights on, on uh, Entity Voices, Paranormal Evidence, which is on KGRA, um, we have different investigators and people from all over. And that's a question we ask every week. Tony Rathman does a brilliant job of doing it. He opens a show and he wants to know when he gets right into it. All right, we know who you are. How did you get to where you are? How did you find a pathway into the paranormal? And what we find, if you, if you look at it, an aggregation of data, just from the people's answers, is that a lot of people were touched by some level of paranormal effect early on at a time when it was taboo to talk about it, at a time when they didn't know anything about it and they couldn't go to anybody to find out about it. Uh, the interwebs wasn't what it is now, so you didn't have that. There weren't a lot of books on it. So a lot of people who do this now have had experiences in their past that have driven them to this point. And that's a passion. And that's a passion for a lot of people. And it will, um, it will make you want to know more. And every new acquisition of information will probably open up more questions. And instead of just quelling the, the, the quest for what about this or what about that. And then, of course, there's the age old thing. I think that's I would think that this is probably a, a modicum of truth for a lot of us is the age old meaning about, you know, is there anything after physical death when 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 the meat suit's gone, you know, and then the soul or the luminous essence or whatever we are that makes these bad decisions that I make daily. Um, where does it go? What happens? You know, I think that's a question that a lot of us have and some people ponder it a lot. And some people might not, but if you ask them, that'll be a hmm for them. So I think those are just a few reasons that there may be more if anybody has any at the end of the show that wants to say that they got into it or they're curious for this reason. I would love to hear it because I think the more pathways into this that we're aware of, the more we can incorporate different people's perspectives because that's those early experiences, let's say, that people have, those things will fuel your, your beliefs and your biases that go into this. And it's very hard. Constantine Radova used to say that one of the issues with assessing things of this nature is that you are part of the problem. You're part of the circumstance that you are trying to assess. And it's really difficult to remove yourself in, in your entirety. Probably damn near impossible to be honest, but it is part of what, you know, what goes into our, our thoughts. We do have those biases. So a big question is who or what are we connecting with? And I'm gonna start with that phrase now, we don't know, but there are theories out there, there are people who have beliefs um, of what we're connecting with or who we're connecting with. The big one, if you talk to some of the great um, ITC reachers, another uh, phenomenal guy, uh, Tim Woolworth, um, will preach that it's consciousness. And so if you, if you ascribe to the life continuing after the physical death, and your soul or consciousness goes on, then that could very well be what you're communicating with. And then when you open it up to the possibility of consciousness being what we're connecting with, then you also have to inherently in that belief, open it up to the consciousness of somebody who let's say is sleeping, the consciousness of somebody who's, who's still alive, not necessarily just dead. And so there are, a ton of studies and findings about out-of-body experiences and near-death experiences. And, and there's a lot of similarities between those two. I'm not going to get into that. I think that one of them has a little bit more of an altered state of consciousness that affects the retention of memory. I believe it's the, the near-death experiences compared to the out-of-body. But it is possible that if consciousness is what we're connecting with, that very well that someone could be sleeping um, and their consciousness, if they're traveling astrally, let's say, if you believe in that, that that's what you're connecting with or it could be a loved one or it could be you know transient spirits that are around it could be at the location whatever so we, we, we don't know but that is probably i put it at the top of the list because i think that's a very highly likely candidate for what we're connecting with um there are some people who will say that it's extraterrestrials um communications traveling through terrestrial wormholes um communications possibly being carried on. There's, there's a ton of EMF going on around us all the time. It could could the, the carrier waves that are, that are allowing radio to fly around, could that be working in what's called a, a frequency multi-dimensional kind of where it's 
like a half duplex or a full duplex system, half being like I have a walkie talkie works like there's a channel of communication. It can go two ways, but one at a time. And where a full duplex would be simultaneously like what we're doing or like a phone call, let's say. We don't know, um, but one of the theories or, or beliefs that people have is that when we do connect and we do get answers, and sometimes it might be even fueled by a, a tonality being maybe synthetic or metallic in the vocal, um, people think it's extraterrestrials. They could be in the atmosphere hidden. Um, obviously the UFO sightings in, in recent times that people have been reporting and the government's been talking about have been um, on an upswing to say the least. So that is certainly a possibility. We also know from from the area of, of quantum physics that there is um, the possibility of a multiverse or multidimensional beings that could be possible um, as who we're connecting with. Um, occupying the same space in a different time perhaps is another another possibility. Multidimensional is really difficult to say. There are subatomic particles in, in what's called quantum entanglement that can be affected and communicate with each other over vast distances, um, unknowingly connected, but still able to, to react and be in contact with each other. So multidimensional or another point in time even in the same space, theoretically a possibility. And then this one, this one's one of my favorites. This kind of falls into the, the multidimensional. And if you were familiar with Rosemary Ellen Guiley at all, I didn't get the pleasure to meet, but uh, I read a lot of her stuff. And um, it's, this is something that comes more from Middle Eastern lore, but it's, it's the entities that are referred to are known as the jinn. That is where the term genie comes from. Um, that is where the term, um, I believe genius comes from also. And the jinn are supposed to be like, we were made of clay and earth and, and the jinn are made of smoke and fire. Um, the, the story in short is that they were having domain over, over our planet in this realm before us. And then they were displaced by the creation of us. Um, I don't know if that's a realistic possibility, but I think when you look at interdimensional or multidimensional where you could have interplaning where there's bleed through, maybe there's crossover in certain areas where one dimension could be crossed into or, or fused with another. I think that the jinn as a multi-dimensional possibility certainly exists as well. And then of course there's the usual, you know, people could think it could be under multi-dimensional could, could qualify as a cryptid, it could be a, a ghost or anything like that. So these are just, again, possibilities. Um, if we knew who we were communicating with and sometimes we get answers that tell us, but you know, the problem is, is that there's no spiritual caller ID and there's, there's no, you know, Zoom, like what we're doing to be able to trace it back and go, oh, yes, that is where it is. So, you know, it's, it's, it's theoretical, but it's, it's fascinating to say the least. This is something that I love um, in a lot of the research I've done. And then talking to people in the paranormal field, you'll hear these terms used pretty much synonymously. Um, life after death and an afterlife. And then so as I read more and, and, and looked into more and then came across some really brilliant authors and, and, and looked at different people's work, I started to realize that there is not exactly a mirror definition to these two terms. They do have a, a connotation that is variable between the two. That the afterlife really is, is a connotation for a place. It's a destination. Like when, when our soul or essence, whatever, passes out of the physical body, that is the theoretical place that it goes. It goes to the afterlife. Life after death is more by definition in inherently, I guess, in, in the way it's even put together the words, indicative of the continuity of our existence, our soul, um, where our essence goes after physical death. So it's, it's the continuation of it versus the destination of it. And I thought that was some of the, one of the authors I note there, Maximilian de Lafayette, gets into that really deep in some of his, his research and his books. Um, I found the, the concept to be fascinating. There is definitely a difference between those two things. Just as a quick little footnote, that, uh, that image there was taken in 2016 on the Queen Mary. Um, in a, the observation bar in the front of the, the ship, there was nobody there. I found that picture four or five months later when I was slowly and a little behind the eight ball and reviewing evidence. We all do that. And um, came across this image of a partially of a woman apparition looking down over a child. Uh, it's, that one still gives me chills. 
every time I look at it. So this I found also fascinating. This this speaks to, you know, we're all human, right? And then you hear that phrase used a lot in regards to dismissing our own responsibility and making mistakes or doing stupid stuff. Hey, I'm human, you know, so I backed into a tree. I'm human. And people do that. But what I found fascinating was as people polling within the last 50 years, I think more accurately around, let's say like the late seventies through the eighties showed that 70% of Americans approximately said that they absolutely positively believed in an afterlife. Of those people of that 70% with complete irony, in my opinion, about 70% of those believers in an afterlife did not believe it was possible to communicate with it. So that for people who may be new to the idea of spirit communication or kind of have a, a pedestrian level familiarity with it, that speaks to the uphill battle, the sw swimming against the stream like a salmon situation that we are, that we are dealt in this field doing research on the daily because you have the people who believe in paranormal effect and believe in multidimensional and ghosts and aliens and Bigfoots and, but they don't think a lot of them still don't think that talking with those realms or wherever they are is a possibility. And so there's so much research and so much evidence that's been collected in the field over years and at levels now that are ridiculous. So many good investigators, so many good teams, researchers are doing this work um, that from a philosophical point of view, it's staggering to me that there would be a, a high percentage of believers who are not believers in the communication aspect of it. So this is this is something I, I like to, to touch upon, the origins. ITC is instrumental transcommunication. Um, there, are, there are those in the field who believe, and I don't disagree, that it, it, it encompasses everything, including, IT, including EVP, I'm sorry, and that it's basically the use of a third party instrument to communicate. I agree with that. Um, but the, the phrase, and in Europe, it's called transcommunication instrumental, TCI. The phrase itself um, was coined by a Dr. Ernst Sinkowski. He's a German physicist. He's a brilliant ITC operator and EVP researcher. He coined the phrase. He came up with it. It was in the 80s. Um, there was something I saw that said, I think it was around 1989. It could be sooner than that. And um, one of the distinctions I think that he saw in it was that in, in a almost passive way, when you collect an EVP, let's say the device is recording it. Now there are like the DR60 that costs a mortgage payment to have the Panasonic. Um, they may have mechanisms inside them that create a, a white noise that if a spirit of a higher vibrational heats it up, that some of the mechanics inside it could cause a vibratory noise that might aid in audio support to allow EVP to be imprinted. Um, they also have certain things, I guess the silicas or ceramic pieces maybe that are inside may limit how much heat the thing can conduct. Um, so that's a possibility that the device is doing it. But the difference I think that Ernst Sinkowski um, wanted to also show was, was that ITC was when you were taking part in what he called it was a mediumistic technical realization of either audio or video, right? With autonomous, independently acting, free will, speaking, behaving structures, or if it's conscious, it's different levels of it. In other words, he, he felt that the device, the radio, let's say the ghost box, the direct radio voice coming out of a long wave frequency was functioning as the medium to allow the voice to come through. And in, in, in EVP cases, the recorders or devices that you use may very well also facilitate that. But it was a distinction, I guess, that he had seen that the device was actually the direct medium, unlike, let's say, like a, a um, Ouija board or something where you would be the channel and something would be coming through you or the, the human circuit if you're holding hands like in a seance. And he, uh, in his time, worked with, to me, what I would say is like the Justice League of, of ITC and EVP researchers. Um, out of homes, the couple of Jules and Maggie Harsh Fishback, they were in Luxembourg, um, look them up. They got communications on unnetworked computers before the interwebs, um, fax machines, phones, like, like landline phones. 
um, the quality and the abundance of communications that they got, again, in Europe, staggering. And so Ernst Sinkowski worked with those people as well as Dr. Annabel Cordoso. And um, I looked to people like that to, to learn because he not only coined the phrase, but he was with a lot of the people who built the foundation that I stand on. And, and a lot of the European researchers jumped through hoops that we didn't have to, that we don't have to. Now, if, if you reference and if you have reverence for that and familiarity with it, you don't have to start at ground zero to try to prove that there's any validity to what we're trying to do. So I'm big, I'm big on the historic aspect of it. In the history of, of EVP and ITC, as early as uh, from what I read in the 1930s, a lot of reputable mediums who were who really um, popular, who were working for high profile clients or clientele, um, were told through communications of the advent of electronic communication with spirit. So it, it predated it. And then shortly after that, I know there were cases when there were two, two priests in Italy um, who were doing magnetic wire recordings for uh, Gregorian chants. And one of them, I think it was Father Gemelli and Father Ernetti, one of them, I think it was Ernetti's father, came through. It was his voice. It was, he called him something that I guess he called him as a child. And so you had a, a breakthrough moment recording on a wire recorder, a magnetic wire recorder. This is before any of the tech that we use now. So it goes back a ways. Some of the early EVP research, the spirits or whoever was coming through did urge some of those researchers to turn on the radios, to use the white noise and the, those devices to advance the quality and the progress of the communication. And so they would use um, a lot of times just a base of white noise and they would use it for, for audio support and it would make the EVP sometimes a little bit louder, a little clearer. You're giving vibration and tone possibly to something that does not have the larynx and the vocal cords that we have to create what we create are magnetic waves. Um, so they're coming through on an electromagnetic wave versus a mechanical wave that like when we speak, it can only propagate or go so far it runs out of steam. And so that was something that they were encouraged to do. And their research proved, um, including Dr. Anibal Cordoso, that that the radio communication aspect of it was not only uh, helpful to EVP, but it was in and of itself a direction to take. In the field, and I love this, um, a lot of people, especially on the European side, will refer to the recordings, the evidence, not just as evidence. They call them PPOs. It's, it's a permanent paranormal object. So what does that mean? Um, in comparison, if you've been on an investigation and somebody feels their shirt got tugged or they see something get knocked over and maybe you catch it on camera. A lot of times when things like that happens, you, it's, like, it's when you stop recording, you're packing up, whatever. Um, you can't, for the purposes of, of furthering research, for the purposes of, of displaying this to the believers and non-believers and, and everybody else, you can't share those experiences when you were touched, when you felt something, when you sensed the presence. But vocal recordings and a video as well is a permanent paranormal object because you can examine it over and over and over again. You can revisit it. You can look at the structure of it on a waveform. You can look at where the spikes are. You can look at the decibel levels. You can try to clean it up a little bit. You don't want to over manipulate it, but you can spend time on it that steps out of the moment where you captured it. And I think when you're looking at this from a research perspective, not being limited to the moment is huge because you have a chance to show, look, I spoke, there's no spike on the waveform, there's a vocal right there, but you don't see it like you see mine. And then there's other things you can do, but that aspect of having the ability to re-examine, again, I think that's a big deal. So from a research perspective and not just telling stories, that helps. I like um, on this aspect of it, this is an EVP based kind of thing. Um, it does apply in some ways to, to instrumental transcommunication as well. But just as a common question or something I, I've heard or seen a lot is when you get the very strong, the very bold class A EVP. And, and I've heard people ask, is that EVP, is that vocal? stronger and do they require more energy? 
And you see right there, like I, I'll start out again with that. We don't know for sure. But one of the things we can do, since when you're talking about spirit communication, you're talking about an equation that at best, we have a handle on 50% of it, at best. So we don't know what's happening on the other side, wherever that is. But we can do is we can look at things that are aspects of communication where we are, frameworks of thought where we are, and then try to apply those to the other side and see if it makes any sense, see if it, if it explains anything or maybe gives us clarity into what just happened or what we've got. So as an example, it, sometimes you'll hear a vocal and it sounds more distant and it's not as strong. And, and so the question of does that require more energy or anything, we don't know for sure. But if you have, just as an example, this is very simple and basic, but if you have a room full of people doing an EVP session and I ask the question, right next to the recorder. And then the next person asked a question and they're sitting over there, their voice on the recorder and they're in the room is not necessarily going to be at a class a level. Sometimes I've had other investigators whose voices were not discernible. I'm like, what did they ask? Even when you got a response, it goes, so the, the response said tree, but I don't know what the question was. <clears throat> so we don't know with where we're communicating if perhaps distance, distance from our devices. If there is some kind of a portal or opening or fusion of realms, let's say, if wherever the connection is, maybe they're not as close to it. So it could be a distance thing on the other side. I have no way to, to, to prove that. There's no way to, to validate that as a reality. But if you're going to examine and think about this stuff, you really do need to look at every possibility. And that is one of them, right? We're in a physical space. Maybe they're in a space that's not corporeal, but it's close to being consisting of matter that feels or looks solid, maybe they're further from the device. Um, the entity speaking may not be directing their words toward us. You, you know, towards us. You, you hear this a lot too. A lot of investigators will say, I think I captured spirits talking to each other. And sometimes what they say may comment on where we are, what we're wearing, what we're doing, what we've asked or said. Sometimes it's insulting, sometimes it's funny. Um, but again, if you, if you plug that into our realm, into our paradigm, right? What do we do when we're like, let's say in a public setting and you and I are, let's say, Phil, we're on a train or something somewhere and we see some weird stuff going on and some people kind of doing something like, we're like, wow, that's, what, what are they? And we'll, we don't want them to hear us, but we want to talk about them. So what do we do inherently? We will lower our voice. So there is a possibility that when you get a vocal that's recorded, that is not class A loud, that that might be by design. If they're aware of us and they're talking about us, especially, maybe they want to do that and they don't want to own up to it and they just want to just talk. And so maybe it's not directed to us and they're lowering their tone or they're speaking at a lower energy level, however they do it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Another fascinating thing about EVP and any electronic communication is, and this has happened to a lot of investigators, when you have multiple devices running. I've had sessions where I had two digital recorders in the same hand and a response comes through, but only on one of them. Why is that important? Because when those who want to dismiss and, and, and debunk and disbelieve try to do that, it's very difficult as, as it is for us to prove anything's paranormal. It's even more difficult to prove that something that is ambient would direct itself to one device in an atmosphere in a room where they're all equidistant or like right near each other. So that's something that will, will vet the quality of your evidence at the very least to let it be unknown and not just something to explain away. And this is something I just wanted to put at the end of it. Um, you gotta be patient. You gotta be understanding of other people. We all have different levels of hearing. We all have different capabilities. Some messages might be intended for you and not for me. Um, the messages could be overlapping. So maybe I hear something that differs from what you hear, or I hear something that's the same as what you hear, or I don't hear it at all, but you hear it. And so we need to, we need to give credence to that. We need to give validity and weight to that because if somebody can catch something and they have evidence, it's not invalid just because you didn't hear it because you didn't catch it. There are differences in how we hear, some people have a different ear for let's say like singing. Singing is being able to mimic a, a vocal tone, to be able to do a certain sound, to, to hit a certain key. 
And that's something that some people are more naturally able to do. Some people can learn it. So just something to, I guess, to highlight here where the individual who is as much a, a tool and a device in the field as the equipment that they carry needs to also be considered. So this I love because it takes what we have and it applies it a little bit to the world of science and it applies it a little bit to um, I, what I felt was a unique perspective when I learned this myself. What makes the voices paranormal? Paranormal is but it's beyond what science can measure or explain. It's beyond what is normal. So when the vocal is captured, when it's on a device, when it's recorded, at that point, at least some of that vocal is in the league with laws of physics and nature as we know them. At least some of it is. So from my perspective, this is an opinion of mine, the vocal itself once captured is not necessarily in and of itself paranormal or at least the focal point of the paranormal effect. What is, in my opinion, is, is its origin. Where does it come from and how was it transmitted? How was it communicated or formed? To me, that is really where the, the focal point of what paranormal effect is, is at. And a, a lot of cases too, I mentioned before, like on, on a waveform with EVP or even with radio voices, the, um, the measurable or visible differences, you can see like on a waveform, if you see a spike, sometimes decibel levels are really low, but the EVPs are there. Um, that is a, a cog in the wheel. I wouldn't necessarily say that decibel levels on a recording is a slam dunk that makes it paranormal. Um, as we all know, at this very moment, radio, AM, FM frequencies are flying past your head. We don't hear them because they're at a level that we cannot do it unless there's a device, a receiver that transduces, that modulates the sound down to a level that our ear can perceive within our frequency range of hearing. So just because something does not register or is not audible or may not even have visual spike does not necessarily mean that is paranormal, um, but it, it can be an aspect of it to support it when you have other things that validate it. So just something to, to point out too, like I said, there are frequencies going past us right now. We don't hear them, but they're there. And if I record them, I'm not gonna get them on a recorder. So this is something that we hear a lot about there being frequencies in the spirit realm. It's, it's a common belief, not a fact, that the dimension of spirit, if there is such a thing, does not have linear time, does not have space time as we know it. Why is that fascinating to me? Because when we talk about communications with spirit, when we talk about frequency with regard to spirit, like people say like higher vibrational beings, mediums will say that they're raising their vibrational level. Um, frequency and the stability of frequency, those things denote cycles per unit of time. You have oscillations per second or per minute. So the question that I ask with this is that, is it reasonable, possible, does it even make any sense to discuss frequencies and rates of vibration independently of time? when those things in fact are denoted by cycles per unit of time. Some people believe that the, the spirit realm is a higher frequency realm in and of itself with what they consider a, a higher concentration of spiritual atoms. Um, in, in our realm, for example, there are more empty space between physical matter that we believe is solid like the table in front of me or the chair I'm sitting on um, but in fact, most of what makes these things up that we consider solid is a lot of empty space. If you laid a piece of metal rebar from coast to coast in this country, 75 or so percent of that bar that you can see and you can touch is empty space between the actual atoms. So that's, that's a, an interesting thing to, to wrap your head around because we perceive everything as solid. And if you can't touch it and you can't see it, it's not there. It doesn't exist. But in fact, um, just alone on, on a subatomic level, there are things that speak otherwise. And if the communication is from a different realm or continuum, which is what a lot of us believe, is it reasonable to think that a, a life force or an entity or a consciousness, right, that's willfully trying to make itself felt, trying to be noticed, sensed, heard in our space time, 
wouldn't it have to, on some level, avail itself to energy? Because if you think about us as the receiver, as a receptor of, of information or those kinds of things, that's what we're equipped to do. We're equipped to see, feel, and hear manifestations of energy. If it's sound, if it's electrical, sensory, whatever, that's what we as the human object are equipped to do. So it makes sense that they would avail themselves of energy to be able to have a presence, to be known, to be recognized, to be felt. So this is something I like um, because this is something I came to learn. There are different methodologies to ITT research. There's not just one way to do it. Um, you're going to meet a lot of people who are going to do things different than you. If you do this, you're going to meet people who do stuff you never heard of. Some of it might sound crazy, but if they're getting evidence, let it go. Because that's really what, what you're trying to do is you're trying to test and experiment and capture and assess. So the first one that I list here, we touched on it very little in the beginning, direct radio voice is a, what I consider from a true, it's a European methodology that started further back than, than the modern ghost hunting movement, um, predates the spirit box or the Frank's box. And it's basically using um, a white noise frequency that is barren of radio emissions. Um, a lot of people in Europe have done it on, on long wave frequencies or short wave or medium wave. I think a, a lot of the, the legendary people in, in ITC history in Europe did use um, different short wave frequencies like, like 11,000 something kilohertz. Um, I've done it here for the last two years, give or take, with uh, a long wave frequency that I knew was completely devoid of radio emissions. And um, I, when you get something without the sweep, without any vocals that are of a human nature coming through, it's staggering. It's staggering. Um, my girlfriend, Lourdes Gonzalez, and I were doing, we've done, again, direct radio sessions, sit, sittings weekly for the last two years. And we were in this very room and we would let the radio establish a connection bridge. And, and like the great Marcello Bacci, who I'll, I'll talk about briefly soon, um, we'd let it establish for it took 20 minutes. We get up and we go to walk over to the kitchen to get something to drink. And we're going to sit back down and do a session or a few sessions. And as we get to the threshold over there um, to leave the room, very clear vocal came out of the radio and said, you're leaving. And we stopped and turned around. I was like, wait, what? Um, that's mind blowing. Um, we've said stuff before when I was like, hey, I heard a helicopter come through and I'll play that piece uh, evidence later where something responded to me about whether I thought I heard helicopter interference on the, on the radio frequency that night. So in Europe, a lot of the ITC researchers who focus more on direct radio voice, not only do it because it came first, but a lot of them um, are in a different place than we are here. They were doing symposiums and, and, and presentations and, and conferences with the goal of furthering the research, getting people in science that weren't involved, involved, trying to get funding for the research. And so it was of their mindset that the more possibilities you introduce into the equation that somebody who does not buy into this can use as an explanation for why you might be getting a false positive or tricking yourself, the more of that stuff you can take out of the process, the better. So, and I've spoke to um, Annabella Cardoso before. I spoke to people who do direct radio and they will never say that a ghost box doesn't work. They will never say that that stuff is not legit, but from their perspective, when their biggest adversary is not the keyboard warrior who's on a post going, oh, this is crap, I don't believe in this stuff. Their, their objective was to try to further the research from a, from a scientific and a philosophical point of view and to get funding for it. And so they were really, really strict with what they would allow in the process because they did not want to leave trap doors for people to go, ah, that's probably the, the station that you, you know, was on the radio coming through. Well, you don't have radio emissions. You don't have that excuse. So that's the method that, that really sucked me in for the last couple of years. But as you see here in the next box, the, the sweeping ghost box, you know, that, that is one of many uh, Holte paranormal. And if you get a chance, go to Holte paranormal.com um, ghost boxes that I have 
Um, one of the things I love about the field is that with the people I mentioned, so many of them who are builders, um, the Halte has rekindled my earlier passion for using the ghost box. Um, while I completely got enthralled with direct radio voice because of the purity of it, really to me, like a half a step shy of EVP where there's nothing except silence and a recorder gets a voice. Um, the sweeping ghost box, when it's a good device and when the session's productive is still equally staggering when you get direct responses and, and vocals that you just cannot explain. Um, you will hear the cynics or the people who don't buy into it, who will try to say, well, you're getting radio to come through. Um, when something answers your question very clearly, when you ask it, if that is radio coming through on a station while it's sweeping, at the time you ask for something, then I want to know, I would like to know when that station is giving away cash and prizes because my luck is phenomenal. So I don't think, I don't think as a, as a debunking explanation that that sizes up, I think it doesn't, it does not categorically cover all the evidence that all the different people in the field have gotten. Um, can it explain some po false positives? Possibly, yes. Um, pareidolia, apophenia, um, as our self-tricking, our self-deception. Um, yes, those things do exist. But uh, as, as a blanket statement overall, I don't think that those things cut it and explain everything. So the sweeping ghost box, um, the most popular is American television and the ghost hunting movement in the last couple of decades, I guess, really from, you know, from ghost hunters and paranormal state and onwards, when you started seeing these devices and then some of the inventors making phenomenal stuff, um, it's more popular and, and almost more instant gratification with how it works. A, a fantastic technique. If you're into ITC and you want to try doing the research in addition to direct radio voice, which is more of a grind to do regular sittings, um, the sweeping ghost box is fantastic. That one right there is, is a Holte Retecus TR604. I have some evidence from that I'll show at the end. Fantastic device, um, not noisy, not bad. Um, sweeping clean and smooth and it just works awesome. Then there are, are some of the affects or the add-ons. Um, there are mobile applications. Um, the mobile apps is kind of like the audio version of the orb. Um, people are very divided. If something's programmable, they don't trust it. Um, I trust me. And so if I hear something come out, if I say, hey, who am I talking to? And the box goes, Philip, or the app says, Philip, and that's who I'm talking to, I trust that if I think I heard that. So can stuff that's programmed um, regurgitate what you say? Um, it's possible if, if, you, if you look at the guts of, of the apps and you see what they have, it's possible that something could be programmed to do that. It, deception is always possible. Um, it is a, it's not only a belief of mine, but it, it, this, this and I'll say is a fact, um, any methodology for paranormal research, any methodology for research by definition is scientific if it's falsifiable. It needs to be falsifiable to be scientific. So if something is capable of producing a false positive, then, then yeah, then that, that methodology does not mean it doesn't work just because it doesn't work 100% of the time. There are machines in hospitals that are meant to save lives. There are machines in, in mechanical shops that are supposed to fix cars. They don't always work. I have a cell phone that's phenomenal. It doesn't work sometimes. Sometimes I drive through areas where there's too many trees and I can't talk to my father anymore because it hangs up. So it doesn't mean it doesn't work. 100% is not a realistic gauge for assessing anything experimental or anything even electronic or communicative. It's not. So some of the affects or some of the add-ons, the apps um, are one thing that people use um, as its own device. They have ghost box apps. They have word bank apps. They have stuff that works similar to the analog devices or, or the devices that maybe have uh, allophones or phonemes, whatever, that are just fragments of sound. The picture there also shows that uh, a version of one of the portal boxes. Um, the portal boxes um, were being labeled uh, an experimental device. I would argue no. Is what the device has, are those guitar pedals, are those effects pedals experimental? Absolutely not. 
they they manipulate the sound they create reverb they backflow they have echo they clean up the noise they've been doing it there's a bunch of people in the rock hall of fame that can attest to it that's not experimental what is is trying to use that in a, in a session where you're communicating for the purposes of making the sound more intelligible and more audible that's experimental what those things do is not and and so the people who try to use that as a way to make real-time communication or even evidence that they review later on cleaner and easier to, dis to discern I, to me i think that's great I, you try everything i will try apps i will try those things because i can't say with any level of certainty or even my belief my belief is really a, an empty vocal gesture if i haven't at least tried and played with it and, and saw how it worked um i have had friends in the past with one of the apps um, I'm not going to name which one it is. There are, are a few that I've liked to use and I've used with success before um, who believe that the microphone on your phone or your tablet, um, not only even if you shut it off, not only work, but it, it could work and circumvent if you shut it off. And so if you say, hey, you know, can you say Philip that because I said Philip, it's going to say the word back and regurgitate it to me. Now, I don't know how it works that it would time it to do that because it doesn't always do that. Um, if it's programmed to repeat things back when I ask the question, um, it fails a lot. But if you use an app and, and you feel like the microphone on the device uh, can capture your voice, can learn the word, and can use it in creating a false positive, then one thing that, that, that the friends of ours were doing at that time, which was I thought a really smart tack to take, was not including the answer in the question. So instead of me saying, how is this drink? I go, what am I holding? I don't use the word drink. I don't use, you know, am I, you know, can you see my glasses? I say, hey, can you see what I'm holding? I don't give the word. That's a way you can do it. That maybe will give you a little bit more of a level of certainty that what you're getting is not um, trickery that's being performed on the internal side of the app. And then lastly, there's something too I have here, the very uh, brilliant gentleman who's uh, an ITC researcher named Keith Clark. Um, as well as actually Mr. Steve Holte uh, have used before. It's a, it's a VST software. It's called uh, SoundSoap. Um, VST is a virtual studio software. And um, we've done it with direct radio voice sessions when we played our big boom box, which you can see in the picture on the far left, the big black radio. Um, we've played it through. And actually, that's, that picture of the, of the computer just to the side of the portal box, that's, that's the VST software. And it's real-time filtration. And, and, and our goal with that was to try to see if we can understand anything vocally that's coming through now, not when we're reviewing it later for the purposes of trying to develop a dialogue, which to circle back historically to Ernst Sienkowski, that was something he also saw as a difference between ITC and EVP was in ITC was the ability to have real time dialogue, not review and then hear it later. Even if you do a burst session, it's still a level of, of delay versus how we're talking now. This is just an example, um, and the pictures kind of show it, of an ITC experimental methodology that, that Lourdes and I have tried for a while. Um, in radio and in frequency, um, there's something that's called heterodyning. In very short, to not get too deep into the technical side of it, you have two frequencies. You're fusing and you're creating a unique frequency, which is the sum and difference of both of those frequencies. And so, in these instances here, we've used a monitor there with an ultra high frequency or a VHF frequency. Um, and the other one, we see there's two radios that are running on shortwave. If you can actually see the numbers, the black radio on the front, that one's running on 22,545 kilohertz, which is a shortwave band. And then the one behind it's running on 222 kilohertz, which is a long wave band. And we would mix those. And sometimes even we would run a tone generator just to add some tonality into a mixing board and then pipe it out either through a portal speaker or through the VST software to create a unique frequency by blending those things. Um, we've had success with that before, we're getting vocals to come out. So it was just, it's a principle of, of radio and of frequency. And what I wanted to do when I came to learn this was to try to plug that into the spirit communication aspect of things and see if it would make real-time communication, which is for us a huge goal possible. I wanted to see if it would make it more possible or make it real actual time back and forth. This is a little quick thing I wanted to include. When we do the direct radio sessions, 
One of the things we also experiment with is called SSB. It's single sideband, um, medium wave, short wave, and long wave frequencies. If you look at that, the second one down, you'll see it's a full AM modulation. So the two humps on the sides are the upper and the lower sideband. The upper sideband on the right, the, low, the lower sideband is the one on the left. And the stick in the middle, that's the carrier wave. That's what the frequencies are riding on. And so what we wanted to do was that I had learned in a lot of radio stuff that I studied that, that one of the reasons that sideband is used is because it's, it's tantamount to give a, a real life um, metaphor or likening of it is it's if you put your thumb over the garden hose and you have a stream of energy or let's say the water coming out, when you do that, you constrict the flow and concentrate it to propagate longer and farther and stronger. And so that's part of what sideband achieves. And so we wanted to do that with direct radio voice sessions to see if that would in any way allow the communication to come through stronger, clearer, and for a longer uh, longevity of stability to be able to, if we did get vocals, to be able to sustain it for a longer period of time by doing that. A lot of times with sideband, what'll happen is, I mentioned there is that the, if you use upper sideband, the lower and then the carrier wave will be suppressed and then that one band is what's functioning for you. And so in a radio wave like that, that full AM modulation that you see in the second box down, all the data in a radio signal that's on a carrier wave like that is encoded. It's all embedded in both bands equally in the lower and the upper. So when you suppress one band in the carrier, you're getting a more concentrated version, but you're not losing anything that's traveling through it. It's just focusing it down into the one. So that was just, just an experimental idea that we used um, for direct radio voice, I um, you know a ham radio operator is probably a lot more familiar with it than I am and have probably used that kind of a thing for communications, but we tried it as, a, as an aspect of spirit communication. So this one, this was one of my favorite ones because this gets into a little bit more of the ITC philosophy. This first one I already mentioned, by definition for something to be scientific in nature, it's gotta be falsifiable. Um, that's huge. Another thing that, um, when you try to, to, to relate what we do to any paranormal research, to science. And a lot of people say that their team in the group is very scientific. And some people say that there's no science. Where are the scientists and all this stuff? Um, the problem with some of it is, is that some of the stuff is, is cookie cutter and it gets thrown into the mix without really thinking it through. Um, as an example, and this one's kind of one of my pet peeves, there is the notion that in science, in order for something to be legitimate, um, to be a vetted result, you've got to be able to produce it, reproduce it three times in a row. You have to do it in threes in a lab. It has to be under a controlled circumstance and you have to be able to do it three times in a row. That, while it might be viable to show a, a continuity and to show uh, an efficacy to, to the method to be able to, to do that, um, if you look at what we're trying to do, there are problems that are inherent in that. And first of all, that is a man-made construct. There is no um, law of divinity that says, if you can't do it three times, oh, well. You know what? Uh, it's not, it doesn't really, I don't think it doesn't apply. Um, and I think part of the problem is, and this brings us to the next point, is I think the field of paranormal research, and especially spirit communication stuff, I think we're held to a standard because of how hard it is for some people to either believe in it or to accept the, the supernatural aspect of what so many people are achieving, that they hold it to a certain standard that you don't see everywhere else. That that whole, you have to bring it into a lab and recreate it. If you look right here, I just named a few. Anthropology, sociology, astronomy, engineering, psychology, those are field-based, legitimate, widely accepted areas of study in science. So I don't think there are many astronomers who are bringing planets into a lab and testing them, doing stuff three times. So I think paranormal research is because of the, the uniqueness and, and the out of the box nature of what we do or what we're trying to do. I think we get held to a really odd standard. And then for the record, and this is where the reverence and familiarity with our history in this field comes, Marcello Bacci, the Italian ITC researcher, um, he did in fact do a lot of that stuff. He had his radios inspected. He had them operating in direct radio sessions while they were open, the guts exposed. 
They were inspected beforehand. They were observed during um, in his entire career as an ITC researcher with phenomenal vocals, unparalleled, never, ever, ever a hint of trickery, of, of falsifying, of deceit. He never took a dime for what he did. Um, and he did, in fact, bring his stuff into a lab. They blocked all RF signal, um, and he still produced voices. There was a very well-known group in Italy called Il Laboratorio. Um, Paolo Pressi was one of the main investigators for the group, spent a few years investigating Bocci. And in one instance, he had told him that he was going to take one of the three vacuum tubes out of his radio. And uh, the vacuum tubes were uh, really the mainstay for how the device worked before transistors, right? So he takes a tube out. Bocci still gets voices. He takes the second one out. He still gets voices. Takes the third one out. And he told him, he goes, if I take all three tubes out and you still get voices, I'm going to eat the tube. So he took the third one out and Bocci still got vocals. They unplugged the device and he still got vocals for a certain amount of time. And so Bocci goes, no, 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 don't eat tube, it's glass. But the point, the point was, he's been down that road. So uh, to me, because we have so much pushback and we have such a, a mountain to climb with trying to prove any of this stuff is valid, why would you move forward without the momentum that people like that have already put in place? That's the foundation. If you're standing on a soapbox trying to say that paranormal stuff is real and you spend your life doing it and stuff and you don't have any basis or, or any roots in the people who came before you, whether they were failures, successes and a combination, which they probably all are. Right? We all fail and succeed. If you don't have that included, I think you're, you're missing some really, really main facts, some main evidence and some support for jumping through hoops that is unparalleled in what we have to do today. Um, one of those challenges we have is that, is that there are people who will come at the paranormal uh, investigators, the researchers, and they will fly, fly the flag of science. Science says this, science says that, this is not possible in science. Science does not buy into it. It's never been proven, so it's not real. Um, so there's a term for that. It was created by philosophers in the earlier 1900s um, but there's a gentleman who I'll refer to shortly named uh, Dr. Charles Tart, who um, he gets credited for the term, but he didn't create it. Again, philosophers had created this years before called scientism. Scientism is a very closed minded science knows everything there is to know. Um, we have it all wrapped up. If it doesn't fit into the paradigm, sorry, not legit. We're not entertaining it. There's no basis for it. That's not science. That's scientism. Science and this is a, a quote that I love from uh, Dr. Rupert Sheldrake, uh, who was one of the attendees for some of the sittings where the skull experiment allowed some of the uh, Society of Psychical Research SPR members to sit in. Science is a method of inquiry, not an ideology. I love that because that's what it is. A, a skeptic, by definition, is seeking the truth. And if the truth is that it's, it's a rational, real world explanation, and there's no ghost stuff going on, then that's what it is. But if it's the other extreme, then that's what it is. If somebody doesn't believe in any of this stuff and they call themselves a skeptic, that is a misnomer. What they are is a believer, but they're a believer in a different paradigm that doesn't gel with the people who think everything is paranormal, which is also not right. So it's important to know the difference between those two things. Those are two opposing paradigms that are in the extreme. But scientism says if it doesn't fit in, we don't entertain it. A true skeptic who is taking a scientific approach will keep testing it and checking it and going over it and looking for absolution and bounce it off his peers. And if it doesn't add up, we'll do it again. And at best, if it's not provable, and, and paranormal effect may never be 100% provable, right? So you have to look at that from a legal standpoint where in a lot of cases, right, it's not a, a slam dunk. It's sometimes it's a preponderance of the evidence. And so if you look at that as a, in that framework of a preponderance of evidence, then you, you have to say that some stuff may show to be paranormal effect and some stuff may not, but it's not Little League baseball. So if the, if the investigator who says this is paranormal fails to meet the burden of proof, the would-be skeptic does not win by default because he didn't score enough points to prove everything's paranormal. The onus is on both sides to prove it is or isn't. So if the, if the believer that it's paranormal can't do it, it remains unknown. 
the, the one of the things that, that's very important, I think, to know is that you'll hear the word skeptic used and, and people take that term because it's it's got societal and sociological connotations that are educated and, and well to do and and dives into the research and 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 it's got positive connotations to it. The word believer is already taken by the person who thinks everything is supernatural. So a lot of times the the, the label skeptic gets taken but they're really not a skeptic. They're a believer. They just believe none of it's real. And I think that's important to point out. And there's a difference between raising doubt, coming up with a rational real world explanation and a possibility compared to debunking, which is definitive. And I think that debunking gets thrown around the paranormal field the same way headache gets thrown around WebMD. It's a symptom of everything. I have a headache. I have a toothache, I have an ankle ache, I have a stomach ache, I'm gonna die, I'm gonna live, headache. So it, it, it gets thrown around too much. I think it's just oversaturated and it's almost become a very trendy to use the word. Just to give you an idea where this mindset even comes from, look at someone who was interested in, in speaking to the dead possibly, right? There's, there's different theories that the phone to the dead and the spirit box concept and all that came in some way, shape or form from Thomas Edison when he first put forth the invention and the idea of his phonograph, it could record and play back the human voice. At that point in time, there was a very well-to-do French scientist who with no basis of proving this came forward and said, and this is a quote, um, I believe exactly, if not paraphrase very close, uh, I have examined Mr. Eden's photograph and can assure you that the effect is accomplished by ventriloquism. So, when somebody has the agenda or they're they're vetted in in the role of the skeptic and they don't want to believe and they don't want something to be paranormal effect ever a lot of times that bias will will come out and without even knowing which we all know nobody now thinks that, that it's that it's sci-fi and, and and supernatural to record your voice and play it back right nobody thinks an answer machine is magic now right it doesn't come from narnia but at that time, it was a very difficult thing to sell as an idea. And so a scientist came forward and said, Haha, he's talking without moving his lips. And the scientist perhaps was talking with his head somewhere buried between his legs. So that's the point is that we can't jump to conclusions and we can't speak beyond what we're able to uh, prove. We can't speak to what we're able to validate and show. And these are some of the terms also like debunked that you'll hear, you'll hear pareidolia, and apophenia, um, which is interpreting patterns or meaningless or meaning in meaningless either visual or auditory data. Pareidolia is used a lot. I think it's pareidolia is initially supposed to be more of a of a false positive or a misinterpretation of visual. It is very it's used very often um, with regards to audible false positives or your mind tricking you. Um, I believe in those things. I'm not saying as someone who does audio research in, in the paranormal that, that, that pareidolia doesn't exist, that false positives and misinterpretations of hearing sounds or things coming through don't exist. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is it doesn't explain all of it. It doesn't explain all the evidence that people have. Some of them are very clear coming across either multiple sweeps or coming out of white noise with no radio emissions whatsoever. And what that explanation as a blanket doesn't ever provide and anybody who uses that as their reason that they don't believe in a, a piece of evidence what they never i've never heard anybody explain is what i call the gaps and what i mean by that is if i'm hearing what i want to hear so i'm not getting spirit communication because it's not real that stuff doesn't happen i'm hearing what i want to hear coming out of the noise that's coming through the sweeping radio if that's true then where is the data that shows the physiological and the biological and the chemical changes and what's going on in my body at the time that those things happen? Because if I do a hundred sessions or let's say even EVP, I ask a hundred questions, I'm getting direct responses, maybe five out of a hundred times. So the gaps that I'm saying that they're not explaining what about the other 95 or 90 times that I don't get what I want? Why did my mind not trick me then? What was the physiological differences going on 
that didn't cause me to hear the wrong thing. And why is that relegated to the paranormal when I'm doing research? Why don't I ever go to work and my boss says, can you hand me the report? And I hear them say, you're going to be the president and we're giving you a raise, right? Why don't I make that mistake in other parts of the life? I mean, yes, we mishear things sometimes, but I think you get the point is that those, those things are so prevalent in a dismissive way in what we do, but you don't hear about the presence in, reg in everyday life. If, if my hearing and my ability to trick myself was so heightened in this stuff, you would think it would have a greater presence in everything else. And it doesn't. <clears throat> so this, this I love because this is me and, and my inner satirist um, taking the concept of doing things in threes to appease the materialists and why I think that's absurd. Inherent in what we do with spirit communication is the possibility or the belief that we think that there's somebody somewhere on another side of something that's going to talk back. If something has the ability to do that, that's an intelligence. An intelligence and any kind of uh, um, independent entity will have a modicum, if not a, a complete ability and free will. So when you say that this stuff isn't legit, if you can't reproduce it three times in threes, if you take that mindset and you build into it the inherent notion that you're trying to communicate with something that if they're able to talk back is intelligent, that does have free will because right, we don't choose to talk to every person that talks to us. So a weirdo on a subway talks to you, you go, hmm, if I don't say anything, if I don't look at them, they can't see me, right? So if you give those possibilities to an intelligence wherever you're trying to reach out, think about how that doesn't make any sense as a framework to legitimize or to debunk what we do. If I use my electronic device, my phone, and I try to communicate with somebody who isn't near me, let's say my dad, and I call him 10 times today, he answers the phone the second time. The other nine times, I don't get him. By that logic, my father doesn't exist because I have a 90% fail rate and I was not able to reproduce his voice on my electronic device in a room that he's not in three times in a row. So I think that when you do this stuff, the, the, the efficacy of the device and the methodology, those things can be questioned. But being able to do it three times in a row as if we have 100% control over anything or any entity we want to talk to in any realm, let alone our own or another one, right? I think that's absurd. So the, the, the reproduction in threes to me is a man-made construct that really does not gel with the nature of what we're trying to do, only having at best 50% control of the whole process if there's an intelligence somewhere else. And I love this too, because people say science, science is everything. Science is absolutely phenomenal. And the people who are doing scientific work in science are brilliant. And I'm not a scientist. I don't play one on TV, all right? I'm not that smart, but it's good to be familiar with how some of these things work because science, we always hear about the laws of science and the laws of science are things that people throw at us to say that what we do is crap. But in a lot of cases, science, what we call laws are, are really educated and, and somewhat practical or pragmatic explanations or definition for things, not necessarily law. If you look at this area of study here, and this one I thought was fascinating, aeronautics, right? The study and the science of flight. When people design flying machines like airplanes, aeronautics is what they use. Aerodynamics is an area of study which explains how these things fly and how, like we said with cars or, or planes, how the flow of air interacts with the physical object that's moving through it. According to the laws of aeronautics and to aerodynamic principles, a bee, the, the, the bumblebee, should not at all be able to fly because of the ratio of the wingspan compared to the size or mass of the body is not sufficient to give the thing flight. But, and I love this quote, the bee flies anyway because it doesn't care what people think. So that's, that's a lesson in, in the laws of science and what people tell you science knows. And because science knows this, if it doesn't fit into this, it can't be true. Well, aerodynamics and aeronautics have produced 
tons of flying things like planes that are happening all the time and successfully so, but there's your exception. And that alone, one exception to me is enough to look at this and go, well, this is not a 100% foolproof theory of how a law of science is beyond question and absolute. That's why I love that. Here's my man, Dr. Charles Tart. I love this guy because he's not a ghost hunter. He's an afterlife researcher. He believes in an evidence-based um, body of work in evidentiary data. And so he's got some principles and theories that I just absolutely love because I don't, I don't feel like in the paranormal ghost hunting community, you hear these things enough. Um, but his works have really changed not only my outlook, but it gave me a, a, a new twist on, on the philosophy that I have with doing this kind of stuff. And of course, he's got, the materialists are the people who, who, are the, who throw science at you, who say that none of this stuff is real because I can't see it, I can't touch it, I can't feel it, whatever. Um, if it's not solid and something I can measure, quantifiable, qualifiable, whatever, it's, it's not real. So a lot of people will say this, and he's got, I love the term, that science has already explained away some caca, and that event, caca, by the way, that's, that's Spanish for caca, and um, I like to translate. And so people try to say that science may not explain away all this garbage now, but eventually science will prove that none of it's real and it all goes away. That's not science. That's promissory materialism. And that's not in all likelihood going to happen. The same way, we, you know, we know that it's not very likely that we're going to see paranormal effect proven beyond a doubt so that everybody on the planet's holding hands, singing kumbaya, believing in ghosts. I don't think that's going to happen either. But promissory materialism is really... Uh, a self-deceiving mindset that I don't have to buy into this stuff now because eventually science is going to kick it to the curb. There's a lot of scientists that are involved in this field, including Dr. Charles Tart, who have done experiments that have shown psychical phenomena very much real, very much measurable, and, and very much staggering in, in the consistency of the data that they've been able to get. He also um, references a term called the God gaps. Um, the materialist science people will look at evidence and stuff, and they'll use this term sometimes for, for things that are gaps in our knowledge of things that science can't necessarily explain. And so the religionists, who are the people who believe that any of these things that we can't explain are of a, of a godly divin, divinity, divine nature, or whatever, um, they'll, they'll attribute divine influence or divine design to these things that science can explain. And so the materialist who's completely not into the reality of anything paranormal, they'll use it in a very derogatory way to kind of like trivialize the, the, the religious minded person and saying, oh, they're just gonna say, well, we can't explain it. So we're gonna label with something that they can't explain and say, well, that's divine. It's not, not necessarily true, not necessarily uh, a kind thing to do, um, but it is a term that you'll hear that materialists will use. And terms I find important because in what we do, if you do paranormal research, we define our field, not just within it, but we define it to the people who aren't in it, the people who don't know about it, who are casually interested. They have a friend who's into it. And so I try to be very mindful of what I, you'll hear me say a lot. I don't know, or we don't know. Um, I don't use the word that's a fact. I'll say theoretically or anecdotally because I think it's important to have accuracy with that stuff. Pseudoscience is a big one for me. I've heard a lot of people in the field use the word pseudoscience. I don't like it because it's indicative of a less than scientific field of study. And when in reality, the field is not a scientific methodology. The field of psychical research has scientific people in it. It has physicists, biologists, engineers, astrophysicists. There's people who are in science that are in the paranormal field as well. The term, it's just, it's suggestive of that our field has methodologies for research that are exclusive to the paranormal. And because they're made up by us ghost hunting people, we're not scientists. So it's not a legit science. It's a pseudoscience. That's not accurate. There are categories and names for things. If you look at them the right way, right? People study dinosaur bones. That's the subject matter. The study of it is archaeology, right? We study paranormal phenomena. The subject matter that we study is those phenomena, those experiences. So you can call it 
paranormal or afterlife or psychical research, but that's what we study. The, these things happen. That's another thing that's important. You cannot debunk or prove something that doesn't happen. So nobody's questioning whether a lot of these, these experiences actually take place, but they're questioning is whether or not the origin of it is paranormal effect. And that, again, the onus falls on the person who believes it is or believes it's not to in some way, shape, or form prove it. But the field is not a pseudoscience. The methods that we use measuring electromagnetic energy, barometric pressure, those things are used in other places. Audio, those things are used in other places. So it's not its own area of study with its own methods that are exclusive to this field. Here's two big things. If you watch me on any podcast or if you ever hear me again, here's one of the ways that I try to be honest with myself and what, what I capture um, as what I call the governance for ITC voices. When I get something out of a radio that I believe is evidence, I believe it's a response. Um, and it's still, if something comes through just randomly, but it's very clear and it's not part of a broadcast, I'm not saying that that's dismissed, but these things are, are ways that you can take it up a notch to vet the legitimacy or the authentic authenticity of what you've got. Timing and relevance. If I turn on a radio and I'm sitting here and I hear the word chocolate, maybe that just came through. Uh, hard to say if it's that clear and it's sweeping through frequencies really quickly, it's still probably anomalous. But timing and relevance is, suggests that if I say I'm about to eat a bowl of something, it's a cold dessert, what flavor is it? And then out of the radio says chocolate, timing. I just asked it and I'm doing it and it's in front of me. Relevance exactly addressing what I'm asking with specificity to what I wanted to know. So those are very important when I assess what I believe, believe to be paranormal effect when I'm getting communication. And that's the guy right there. I talked about him before. That's a vacuum tube radio. The one in the beginning of the slide presentation is one I have that looks like that. Um, that is Marcello Bacci. I, I use the term goat. If you've uh, a sports fan in any way, that's uh, greatest of all time. He has aggregated more unparalleled, uh, un, not debunked, uh, proven, mind-blowing, audible evidence than probably every paranormal show on television combined. He's been shown to be completely legitimate and genuine. He's never taken a dime. And if, if there's documentaries on, 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 Vimeo called Calling Earth, and there's another one that's called The Afterlife Investigations about the Skull Experiment, um, both which show Marcello Bacci in it. And it's unbelievable the real time dialogue that he's gotten out of the radio. So I think it's a mistake for anybody who does what we do when you're trying to build your case and your evidence and trying to, as everybody says in the field, I want to move the field forward and legitimize things and prove. And I think you can't exclude somebody like this from that discussion. One of the reasons I think that happens is because it's, it's an older technique. It's in Europe, it's not in the States. And there's a mindset, I think, in a lot of today's generation that, that believes that everything we do is in some way superior to those who came before us, or parents or people who were before us. And that's not necessarily true. Even historically, if you look at marvels like the Great Pyramids on the, on the Giza Plateau, that's Fourth Dynasty. So the, the regular run-of-the-mill science accepted belief is four dynasties later, they perfected it. They failed, they failed, they failed, boom, they got it. The problem with that is that the fifth dynasty pyramids are in ruin. They're not to the exact specifications and, and the, the precision that the, the fourth dynasty great pyramids are, great pyramid and the, the three in Giza are, they don't match that quality, um, the placement of it, everything. So how did they take that gradual evolutionary approach and then perfect it? And then the next generation just couldn't do it again. So it's not necessarily that everything as pro progress happens is better than what happened before. Sometimes we take a turn for the worse and we're trying to move forward, but we don't. And that's a learning experience. Um, 
And then lastly, a lot of the things that are sling, that people sling at us to do to prove that what we do is legit, he's done it. He's had his devices taken apart. He's had RF signal block, like a Faraday cage, all that stuff, and he still produced voices. Another giant in ITC, again, from, from the European side, Hans Otto Koenig. He's got a book out also. Um, he built the, uh, what he called the UDS system in, in a generator. He built several devices. I think the UDS system was his last one that was kind of a, a conglomerate of all the previous ones that he had done. And he was inspired um, by the George Meek, William O'Neill Spiritcom model that had uh, 14 different oscillators and had the entire male vocal spectrum covered um, for a real-time communication that some people believe was legitimate and some people believe was, was hoaxed. Um, even among the community, that's very divided on that issue. But the, the, um, the ground that it broke, the Spiritcom model, inspired uh, this gentleman who was a brilliant scientist and, and he came up with several systems, again, one of which being the generator. And he, he was trying to use UV and a bunch of different things to work on what I mentioned earlier, which was the stability and the longevity of communication with spirit. What he called it, um, he, he used a great example for it. It was what we're trying to do is really is temporal synchronization. Typically when a radio transmission and reception, you're in the same either line of sight or you're in the same realm at least. We're talking about a different dimension or realm or wherever this is. And we're trying to receive and communicate with them, but we don't know where them or it is. So he likened it to trying to drive on a highway at a very high speed and put your hand out the window and shake hands with someone else in another car and then how long you could hold it before you had to let go. And so that gives you an idea of how difficult and how unstable the process can be and why a lot of the communication we do does not last as long as we want it to. Had to include her uh, for direct radio voice and for a lot of ITC stuff. Um, she's a huge mentor and influence. I've talked to her on the phone a, a bunch of times. She texts me sometimes out of the blue. That's her new book, Glimpses of Another World. Um, she is a brilliant, kick-ass lady. And she's worked with Robin Foy from the Skull Experiment. She's worked with Bocce, parapsychologist David Fontana, Ernst Sienkowski. She's worked with a lot of who I consider the European royalty of ITC. And, and she does brilliant work with her direct radio voice sessions. This is a little bit of, of the Philip Wyatt zone. Um, well, I have not experimented in a lot of different things you have with visual ITC and, um, and water, which again, what you've gotten is, is amazing. Uh, I have used what's called the Schreiber, Schreiber or Schreiber, I'm not sure the, the correct pronunciation. I'm gonna say Schreiber. Uh, it was a German scientist, um, gentleman named Klaus Schreiber who did a video feedback loop. And so for a while, um, Lourdes and I were experimenting with the feedback loop and, and for, the new person or the enthusiast who maybe doesn't familiar with this, you're basically taking a camera and you're having it point at a monitor. The output from the camera is going into that monitor. So you're filming what the camera is seeing, which is what it's filming. So you're creating a, a loop. This specific capture I thought was interesting. Um, if you look on the right side or maybe your screen left, the, um, the frame sequence, I found this image doing stop motion one frame at a time on the video. The number one was the frame before it. The number three was the frame after it. And that one frame, I got that Saturday Night Fever dance floor looking thing, which I don't know what that is. Um, to my knowledge, I've not been able to get anybody to explain that to me from a, a, a digital or a television technical point of view that would create something like that. It's not even going up and down, take up the screen. It's got depth like it's going out. I don't know what it is. I don't know how it happened, but it was in one frame. This one was also really, really um, creepy would be the word I would use. The image that I got in one frame on the far left, which different people see different things in these sometimes and interpretation is part of it. But it appears what to me looks like a gentleman wearing glasses, like sunglasses perhaps. And he's holding a dove in the foreground and it also appears that right next to his head on his shoulder is an owl. And so the, the, the image right beside it, I show what looks like the eyes and the beak. And if you look at that, where the green lettering is, that looks like a finger and it looks very much like that. 
like the fingernail. I hope I don't have any dirt under my fingernails because I'm putting it on camera, but I'm taking a risk here. So it looks like that. It looks like a fingernail. And then you see here side by side is the, the owl that was the closest breed to what I could find that looked kind of like that. And then you see the image to the side of it, which is what's on his shoulder to the right side of the picture, which to me also looks like an owl. So this is, this is some of the fun stuff. Now I, I put together a few clips of evidence. This is the direct radio voice um, session. Let me know when I share this, if the, if the audio also does or does not come through. Um, audio evidence is, is not fun without audio, I find. But this was a session that Lourdes and I were doing where I used to live um, pretty much next door. And that particular night, we were on a long wave frequency that we had used all the time, and it sounded da -da 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 -da, and it sounded choppy. On the recording, you'll hear me say maybe it's helicopter interference. We're very close to New York City, and um, it was about just under two minutes after that. So for the purposes of the video, I, I cut out a lot of the da -da 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 that you would be listening to, and I kind of jumped when Lourdes just finished saying something, and then a voice responded to us and told us that it was not a helicopter. Now, this is Again, me sitting in my living room. I'm not broadcasting with a microphone. I'm not transmitting out. So truck drivers, ham radio, CB, um, people with walkie-talkies, baby monitors, nobody's hearing me. I'm talking in my living room. So for the fact that somebody used the word helicopter in response to me is at least anomalous. So let's see if, let's see if this plays and comes through. Hear it? So I'll skip ahead. Let me know because I know I've been talking for a long time. I'm chatty, but I love this and I appreciate I really appreciate the opportunity. This is a direct radio voice. This is at Kingsland Manor. We were guests of Island Paranormal Society, Matt and Josie Haas. And it was National Ghost Hunting Day. I think it was two years ago. And we got a female vocal that came through super clear in the beginning of the night. Nobody was recording. I was just setting that thing up. At the end of the night, everybody was upstairs for the Q&A. This is still running in the basement. They have cameras down there for National Ghost Hunting Day. The video shows the empty room. Something uh, female comes through in full vocal tone um, with nobody in the room using jargon that was very much indicative of the time period. Um, other parts of the audio from this also had a name that was um, part of the history of the house that the historian Leon Kish, who was a fantastic guy, um, also validated for us afterwards. But this, so this is a direct radio voice. This is 222 kilohertz long wave with absolutely no radio emissions. The noise floor the eh, bottoms out and gets quiet. Now there's no noise coming out of it at all. And then the voices.
So for the purposes of time, I'll kill it there now. Um, that used to be a speakeasy and a brothel. There was prostitution, there was gambling, there was a lot of the CD underbelly stuff that happened in that place. Um, around the years and the, the era it would have happened, harlot would have been the term that would have been used for a prostitute. Um, I went over that audio a lot. I'm confident in, in what the annotations show for the words. Um, I heard that first on the video footage not even on my digital recorder. And I was blown away because I knew the room was empty, not just a camera, but even anywhere off camera, everybody was accounted for upstairs. It was a small group. And so that was, to me, was, was nuts. This is an RCA super radio um, ghost box sweeping radio. I believe it's sweeping AM. This is built by uh, Steve Holte of Holte Paranormal. Again, please go to holteparanormal.com and, and look at what he has. Um, their boxes are amazing. Him and his wife, Katie. So this is, this is a, um, a session I did here at the house and I was in the room by myself. Lourdes walked in the room. And so for the pareidolia and tricking myself into hearing what I want to hear, I asked, um, oh, actually that's a different one. I'm sorry. This one was the same thing, but I had asked in this one who came through during our, our direct radio the night before. That's a different file. We'll get to that one next. So this one I had asked who came through the night before. Um, so in no way, shape or form, was the answer that came through what I was thinking. Not even close. That's the radio. Who spoke, who spoke to us during our direct radio last night? So that one... Again, I was not in any way, shape, or form thinking about Houdini. I just wanted to know. I was thinking maybe my mom, somebody, you know, family-wise maybe came through. Um, was not expecting that whatsoever. So I think I skipped the slide here. That's all right. So this one, this is the one I have right here. This is a, the Ratekas TR604 built by Holte Paranormal. Um, this one I was asking how they liked the device. This one is that again, the RCA super rated. This is another sweeping box um, from Halte Paranormal. This was at my, my dad's house. My mom passed away at the end of uh, January, 2019. Um, so I wanted to see if I got anything on her. Um, so I just asked, um, you'll see, I said, Merry Christmas. And I said, you know, I'm thinking whatever happens, happens. I wasn't asking a question for an answer. So I wasn't expecting to hear anything that I wanted to hear, um, but this happened. <laughs> Those are the whole tapes, by the way. That's Lourdes and I. That's Lourdes Gonzalez, who's my my partner in, in ITC crime. And that's Steve and Katie Holte, who are two of the best ghost box builders, bar none, in the business. They're, they're great. Um, so that was that was just, I didn't ask any questions. I just said Merry Christmas. Um, and for anybody watching, too, also, a lot of these things, if you hear it repeated, I just loop it so that you can hear it again. Um, so I have to put the whole clip again with the intro and all that garbage. But um, it said it once. This is a, a recent one. We were with New Jersey Paranormal Project at a place called B. McNally's in Hackettstown, New Jersey. This was with the, the little Ratekas TR-604 box that I was showing by Halte. And um, two vocals came in at the beginning of this thing that said a name and then says what. Um, that were so clear 
that if we didn't know who was in the room, we would have thought somebody in the room spoke, but it was nobody in the room. But the clarity was kind of staggering when we heard it. You hear Lourdes and us laughing. That was that was crazy. In a lot of these clips, you hear Laura giggling and laughing like a school kid, because um, she's still as excited about it as she was when she started. But it's I mean that was really like those vocals pushed way over the static, and that was really really clear. Um, there was uh, I think a tom that was associated in the history of the place also, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so this is also from that same place. This is the same radio. Um, I use it with the annotations. You see the radio pop up there also. This was also really, really interesting and clear communication. It responds directly to Lourdes' question um, twice. That's my commercial for Halte Paranormal. That, that device produced both of those clips. This one is a very cool, unique device. Um, we were talking about it before the show. It's the Forever Box number three. It's the third one. Katie Halte made it. Um, when we talked about trying to vet the authenticity of what we get, right? Um, people try different methodologies. Another thing we try to do is uh, people do reverse speech, um, sweeping in different directions. Uh, a sweep circuit will go through the band um, you can have it be linear. This device has a linear sweep where it would go from low to high frequencies, let's say on AM or FM. It also has random where it will jump around the band. It won't just go from the 80s to the 107s and back around again. Um, this box also has reverse and forward speech. So literally anything that comes through it, if it's in reverse mode, will will make all the words come through backwards. So if something comes through spoken forward, like I'm talking, that's an anomalous thing. It shouldn't come through. Um, it also will do a, a percentage of forward and reverse at the same time while either linear or randomly jumping around the band. This one was take, it was not that long ago. I was on the back porch of the house. It was like two in the morning. I was finishing my cigar because damn it, I wasn't wasting a good cigar. Um, so I just ran the box out there and I put my phone down with wave pad and recorded it. And so other than the smoking the cigar part, it spot on said where I was and what I was doing um, or when it was rather. And interesting because it's part of it that sounds a little slurred in the middle. And I think it's because it was reversing and jumping the band at the same time as the words were coming through in succession. So you have clarity in the first words and then the last one, but the two in the middle, I, you can hear them. I played it back. I, I did it slow. Um, I tried the voice printed to match it. I'm pretty confident that's what it's saying, but just as a little bit slur to the, to the two words in the middle. Also kind of fun to to note. That's actually the last. That's the last slide. Also fun to note, kind of too, that the um, the last two words at the end of that file sounds like it's saying "fat cat." And my son has a orange tabby who we always call him "fat cat" because he's gotten a little rotund. He's a gordo gato. Oh my god, my head's about to explode. This has been so freaking amazing. <laughs> Hopefully it was fun. Hopefully it wasn't too uh, laden with me just rambling. But, um, but the viewership, I think everybody loved it. 
Um, I didn't have a few questions. I'm not sure if they're still on or not, but let me, I screenshotted them because uh, I can't read my own handwriting half the time. Um, oh, where'd it go? Do you think spirits on the other side can use Morse code on our ITC equipment? My answer would be, because the question was, do I think? I think so. Yeah. Um, I haven't done experimentation exactly with that, but I'm trying to remember. Actually, Steve Holte may be one of the people, um, but I know people who have. Um, I mean, it's, you know, you're talking about a system of dot dash that's very rudimentary, even, even where we are as communication goes. So I think it's, I think it's possible. I think if there's intent and any kind of understanding of us where they are, that it's reasonable to think that if they thought that was a viable method to use in a given situation, they might try it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it could have been a sailor or somebody on a submarine. I mean, who knows? Right. Um, here's one that is, I, I can answer to this one, but um, I think Glenn's already had to sign off. Can uh, you have an evil spirit come through the voice box and say crazy things? Yes. <laughs> That's yeah. mainly why um, ghost hunters want to use this because they love to get the word demons and Satan and all that stuff. They can. I mean, you got to be prepared for that. You know that. I'm sure you got it. Definitely. Yeah, it, it, you're blind dialing, basically. If this is a phone call to the dead kind of a concept, you're blind dialing. You don't know. I don't know who's, who's connected. Somebody might say they're this or they're somebody or you don't really ever know. And it's possible there are there. I don't think malevolence is as common as television might make it seem. Um, I think just because something even says the word demon doesn't mean that's what it is. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that you can get something negative. I mean, when I first started really into ITC at home, you know, my, my whole intention was to get higher realms. I wasn't looking to get, you know, people on their way to hell. I wanted to get the highest and best. I mean, that's, you know, the debauchy route. But I was prepared. I had done some research and I knew some ugly things could come through. But when I first started, I got nothing for three weeks. I sat every night, I spoke to the spirits and I had someone else in ITC that said, they've got to learn to know your intentions. They got to learn to know you, get to know you, feel your vibration, your energy, what you're really here for. And after sitting and talking, like, you know, my name is Philip. I want to talk to the highest and best, you know, blah, blah, blah. After three weeks, it started and it was just nonstop. No, I did get a lot of ugly, nasty things at first, like, you're such a loser, you know, those kinds of things. But I was prepared for it. And I just said, well, if I'm such a loser, how am I talking to you? You know, not. <laughs> You know, and I got, I'm Zozo. And I said, well, I'm Zozo, I'm Elvis. You know, you, you got to, because you don't know who you're, you're getting. But right. then after that, I would get several entities who had the same name that came time after time. I had an Albert and an Eric that visited me all the time. They'd come through, hi, it's Albert. And Eric would always say, I love you. I mean, I don't know who they were, but, um, you know, there's so much wonderful knowledge to get from the other side other than just for the ghost hunting so that's what yeah. i'd like people to experiment with you know i tried to get people to do that with the itc collaboration in the beginning when i started it i wanted to do experiments with groups to see what we could get as a group energy but you know that was like trying to herd cats getting people to do those things i mean we did the code word experiment we did the um black box experiment because I wanted to see if the spirits could see us and communicate information to other people mm -hmm. what was going on in one location and it was it was fascinating but um I just love ITC yeah um, let me see what other questions that also all falls under the idea that I was mentioning before that we don't if it's communication with a perceived intelligence, you can't control that half of it. No. You can't control whether they, you know, pick up the proverbial phone. Maybe they don't talk one night because they don't want to. You ever get a phone call from somebody that you like and you go, ah, not tonight. I'm like, I'm never going to get off the phone. But you don't, who knows what's happening on the other side and how, how it comes through. And if it's something, you know, that they can ignore, or they don't want to do it. 
And uh, Ken, getting a few questions, can bad spirit take over your, your spirit box session? You know, people, how do you protect yourself against something evil coming through? You know. I don't think it take it over. I mean, I, if something negative comes through, we've had it happen a few times, not a lot, um, doing direct radio, and we, we shut the session down. We said we're not going to accept that. We we come oh, with respect, absolutely. and that's the way we expect to return. And otherwise, we're not gonna, we're not going to talk. We're not going to record you. We're not going to review absolutely. what we say. It's, we're done. And once they realize you're not playing, they usually stop. I mean, all that nonsense I got in the beginning stopped. Um, how do you successfully open up a line of communication with spirit? Is there an approach that helps one uh, succeed when starting this? So. The only approach I ever learned, and I'll go back to my, my dear friend, uh, Dr. Annabelle Cardoso, because um, not in ghost box stuff, but when I was learning the very beginnings of direct radio voice, she says in, in her first book that you, you have an appointment, you do the same night every week, the same mm -hmm. time, and you develop a routine, and that eventually you'll start getting EVPs from the audio support, and then it gradually may turn into some disembodied kind of and then the vocals will start to come through the radio and that sounds all nice and well like oh it's in a book of course they're going to say that because they have to have some kind of structure it's a book but when we did it with direct radio that's exactly how it played out and um it would get to the point when we would turn the boom box on and put it to 222 kilohertz the same frequency the same night every week at approximately the same time it was like within a half an hour the same time we would almost get vocals within minutes yeah. when we turned it on because we had, we, I believe this is what we believe, you know, we don't know, but we, we, we set an expectation and, a, and a, you know, we have linear time. Who knows if they do, but we set some kind of a, of a pattern that might be something that's observable. I think it's an energy pattern. I mean, it's just like with uh, medium shift circles, same time every week, same location. Yeah. And it's an appointment you have with the other side. And, yep. and they know to show up because they want to work with you as much as we want to work with them but it takes patience and consistency a lot of a lot of us don't have the patience to put in the consistency to get the results you know we, we're, we want instant gratification <laughs> yeah. um what else did i have here and direct radio is a grind it's not instant gratification you know the ghost boxes can be more gratification quicker um and they work don't get yeah, me wrong um, but the direct radio is more of a grind. I think that's one of the reasons why you don't see a lot of people doing it. And even yeah. people in the field have tried it, but that I've not seen a lot of people actually stick with it. We did it for almost two years without missing a week mm -hmm. at all. Yeah. The same day. Exactly. And it's hard. I mean, now we, we've now been on a little hiatus, but we're looking to get back to it. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a grind. And then you got to listen to it hours of you that frequency you're using. They're trying to <coughs> connect the dots, <coughs> excuse me, and, and get that connection to you. And I believe there yep. are teams that you have teams on the other side that are working with you to have this communication. I mean, yep. I believe that. I believe that. That's actually Ruben another European. She has, she has, they have names, these teams. Yep. These yep. teams. That's a European mindset in ITC in, in, yep. in the States where it's mostly spirit box based stuff. Everybody thinks it's just ghosts and spirits that are flying around you in your immediate environment. But in, in, in Europe with a lot of the direct radio stuff, they believe that there's ports of communication that there's stations called yeah. Rio do Tempo or time stream. Mm -hmm. um, and there's other ones as well. I can't remember the names of all of them that yeah. they'll that connect with and they have a certain level of tech and they're allowed to talk about certain things. And then maybe certain times they can or can't talk yes. like that's, that's what they believe. Is it proved? No, but, there was an instance when we did a direct session one night and because Lourdes is Latina and she said Rio de Tempo, not Rio do Tempo. Yeah. And the voice came through and said do Tempo. <laughs> corrected and, her. And corrected her. <laughs> That's great. I mean, uh, we tried the experiment of the enlightenment, enlightenment experiment, <clears throat> doing sessions and asking some really deep, serious questions about you know, what happens to murderers when they cross over, you know, that type of thing. And I've got some of those sessions on YouTube, on my YouTube page that there were things, and I would always ask permission from the highest elders who's in charge of the communication to allow these questions to be answered. And some of them flat out said, no, <laughs> I mean, just no. 
I mean, just like it's fascinating. Yeah. That it boils down to what I was saying before is that if you think, even the people who don't believe in it, that say prove it, mm -hmm. right? So they're asking you to prove that you can communicate with an intelligence somewhere else. So if you're if you're building into your assessment an intelligence somewhere else. You have to also build in free will. And with that, you then you go back to the example I gave with calling my dad 10 times and getting him once. Yeah. He's got free will. He's got a life. He's doing stuff. He's not picking up the phone all 10 times that I make the phone call. So that doesn't mean he doesn't exist because I couldn't get him on a communication device three times yeah. in a row. What do you think? Um, because we do hear the word help a lot when we're doing ITC. What do you do when you hear that word? Like help, I mean, it comes through so clearly so often during ITC sessions. What, do you try to do anything? Do you offer, you know, prayer? Do you ask what, what you could do to help? Do you ever, what's we, your go-to? It's interesting, that's a great question. We, uh, as a group, when I've with different teams and people, a lot of people will ask, how can we help? What can we do? For me personally, because I, I accept wholeheartedly a lot of the unknowns and a lot of the unprovable aspects of what we do, mm -hmm. to me, there's a certain level of, of I don't want to say arrogance or hubris um, in the idea that if somebody, if, if it's an entity or a consciousness, it's in another realm, let's say it was a human that was once alive, but their consciousness passed on, so they're already dead. Yeah. If I say to you, like if you, if you called me tomorrow and said, I got a flat tire, I'm on the interstate. Help. Yeah. And I went, call me anytime, Philip. I'm, I'm happy to help. It's an empty gesture because yeah. what can I do from where I am? Mm -hmm. So if somebody's already dead, if it's a human spirit, if it's an entity that was never human, mm -hmm. but it's a spirit somewhere else, I mean, for out of respect and 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 being a participant in the conversation or dialogue, I, I may in some way approach that um gracefully, mm -hmm. but I, I am very much aware from where I'm sitting that if I ask a spirit, if I can do something to help, that there may not be a lot that I can do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so maybe offering to listen or, or you know, I, it's really difficult because of the, the, the dynamics. If, if they in fact exist the way we believe they may, mm -hmm. not, I don't know how much I can do. Exactly. Um, Cause usually, I mean, 99% of the time, you don't get a follow-up. When you say, you know, how can I help you? I would use that, are you lost? Right. Sometimes you may get a yes, or I've gotten, I'm afraid, or it's dark, you know. Just curious of what other people, you know, think their responsibility is. If they're going to do ITC and their hearts in it and their intentions is, you know, to give back, to share love. I mean, you know, we have some type of response we need to, to give them. I agree. I, I agree. I, it's a difficult, that's a difficult one, but that's a really, it I need it to we don't know who we're dealing with or if they're being honest, yeah. but, um, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's getting late. So I'm going to wrap things up for us. I mean, cause I could talk about this all night. You know, I can, cause I, yeah, no, I, I, I admire your work equally as well. So I appreciate, I appreciate the opportunity. I love to whip out some spirit boxes right now, but it's like going on 11. So I got, but, I got all, I got all my whole tape boxes <laughs> on yeah. the table. So yeah, I'm not, I'm not just promoting my friends or talking about the stuff they do. I have my Steve's box 52. I have all these things. Um, it's it's fun. I love experimenting with it, and and they make really good tech. Um, and then I have the big boom box, and I got one of them big vacuum tube radios like Pachi, um, that I've also played around with as well. So um, that's for me, cool. it never gets old. I've looked for those at um, flea markets and things, and I never found one that's in working order that was affordable. So eBay, yeah, I actually these radios, the vacuum tubes with the nice wood finish, and yeah. like they um like the Normandies or the Grundigs or, or the Telefunken, or mm -hmm. this one is a Saba. They're all, the German ones are very hard to find. And, and a lot of them are in the 900 plus $200 shipping category. Exactly. I found this one at a fraction of that. Wow. Um, and then jumped on it and it oh, works. Yeah. Um, I have mostly uh, Radio Shack hacks. I love those. I mean, I like to collect them. This as a collectible yeah. item. I've gotten amazing results out of them. And yes, you have. Last year, I was able to buy my first, probably my only Frank's box. So, oh, nice. 
that I've got that's very special. I've only used it a few times. Just, um, I don't know, it's, it's something that I, that's so reverent to me is that box, you know, it's not one I just want to take out and play with. But um, anyway, let me give everybody a rundown of what we got coming up next, if I can see here without my glasses on. Um, June 23rd, Lisa uh, Schnoor is doing a presentation on legends and lore. Let me see if I can. Awesome. Um, urban legends that are actually worse than the online stories focusing on cemeteries. I mean, and if anybody knows Lisa, she has, she's the haunted library and has one of the top 10 paranormal uh, website blogs in, in the country. I mean, her, her website is phenomenal. Uh, go check it out. Uh, July 7th, we have uh, Reverend Sean Whittington. Um, he's going to be on with Heather. I'm not exactly sure what they're talking about. Uh, July 21st, scariest cases um, that had to be canceled the other week because of some people had some emergencies. Um, August 4th, uh, uh, Larry Lawson is a former sheriff and founder of FPBI, Invest Paranormal Investigations. Um, August 18th, controlling investigations to prevent false positives with Steve Dills, Peter, Cliff, and Heather. Um, That's a good show. September 1st. Steve Dills, he's a good investigator. Oh, yeah, he's brilliant. Um, Chris McKennell, paranormal ethics and cases he did with the Warrens. Um, then we've got a lot more. We've got uh, Lloyd Auerbach coming back. Um, he's great. So, got some great things coming up for you. So, That's some great shows. Again, Ron, I truly appreciate it. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. And I will have the video up on YouTube at some point. Um, I may have to break this one up in two parts to get it uploaded. But um, thank you. I want oh, you to thanks. come back another time. And let's just do a live ghost box session sometime. That'd be fun. Yeah, we should. You're one of the people that we want to get together with and investigate in, in actual in person. So that'd be a great honeymoon for you too. Let's do an investigation. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you so much. And um, I'll see you next time. Thank you.